Have you ever lost data from a failed hard drive? What did you lose and what was the consequence? I want to hear all about it in the comments below while I roll the intro. Now this was not the video I had anticipated doing today. When I first started being a, a YouTuber, I guess officially, was back in May, uh, merely uh, three months ago, four months ago maybe, I purchased uh, an Easy Store hard drive from Best Buy, four terabytes, that I was going to to uh, transfer and store all my all my footage to the hard drive and uh, have a good good storage location for all the footage that I was about to take. And I did that and it died already. Now, the advice that we always get when we're talking to the tech guys at Best Buy or wherever is that I always buy two hard drives when I buy one hard drive. And they, they tell you you gotta back up both. Um, there's also cloud services like Dropbox that I, that I personally use, but uh, the footage that I was taking was taking up so much space that it was taking up all my Dropbox space. So that's why I ended up getting a hard drive. Long story short, I have all the footage that I had ever taken for this channel, uh, both in raw and edited uh, final version. And uh, I have at least two episodes for this channel and several others for another channel that I'm working on um, gone now. So I have, I have two two episodes worth of footage, unedited, that is lost, that uh, was was going to be for the future. So after discussion with uh, Western Digital Tech Support, they determined that indeed it is dead and that there's nothing they can do except for send me a new one. And I said, well, since I'm still in the warranty and we're so uh, short on uh, on the purchase to, to death, death window, I asked if they have a data recovery service. Now, there are data recovery services out there, but they start at around $200. I've seen them low as, for as low as $50 to, 50 to $150, but you know, all the stuff you kind of have to send it away for. Um, and it's just, uh, it, it, it's just probably not worth the money or the hassle to just redo the footage and uh, redo the episodes. So here I am left with a piece of junk, and they're sending me a new one, and I gotta send this back. They, they put a, a hold on my credit card for the cost of this that they're going to lift when they receive this. So, you know, it's just a lot of hassle when they could just let me go back to Best Buy with my receipt that I have and uh, actually just make an exchange. But no, I got to go through Western Digital. Pain in the now at this point, I can get upset. I could quit YouTubing. I could quit the project but we all have the same choices to make in the face of adversity. We can dwell on the negative, let it drag us down and affect everything we touch, or we can hike up our pants, learn from the experience and drive on. Experience is simply the name we give our mistakes. You see, I know the hard drives fail. That's knowledge. I know the storage devices need backup. What I didn't suspect is that I would need it within the first three months of owning it with less than 10% of the capacity used up. Now I do. Experience is what you do with knowledge. Well then, that's enough philosophy and memeing for now. Let's get into what I was really going to show and tell today before I lost all my footage. Here's the current state of our bass guitar neck. You see it's perfectly profiled and it's got the truss rod installed already. I was gonna show you all that in one video. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna demonstrate the use of a template with flush trim router bits. Using a template along with a flush trim router bit is one of the key skills to have when building a guitar. I assume you already know what a router is, but a flush trim router bit is a specialty bit that uh, you can get and it uh, is meant to to ride along the edge of a template on this roller bearing that's mounted 
at either the top of the cutting bit or the bottom, like so. Your template doesn't have to look like this. This is uh, just what I cut out of, of this press board and actually doubled it up to give it a little more thickness. Uh, so a quick explanation of how the template, uh, the, the trim router bit works is, is um, so in this case I had the template screwed to the, the piece I was working. Before this, this was wider, uh, it was proud of the side of the sides of the template. I took it as close as I could to the line without hitting the template with the bandsaw. So I took it over to the router table with the with the uh, bit sticking up and the bottom bearing exposed. And this went onto the table upside down. And the way this works is this roller bearing guides along the template, like so. So it rolls right along there and it takes off the material from the piece that you're working. The idea is the less material you have to remove, the smoother it's going to go. The less likely chance you're going to have tear out. So as you see here, this was perfectly routed along the template riding along this bearing. Alright guys, as I was fishing around looking for something to, to cut this Telecaster neck out of as a demonstration only uh, to demonstrate the router technique. Uh, I came across this interesting piece of maple I've been carrying around for years and I thought if I'm going to cut a neck shape out of this maple I might as well go all the way and make a whole neck because as it happens I have a Telecaster body without a neck. Uh, so that works out. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start a new project. I was not anticipating starting a new project. Like I need another new project right now, but uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a complete neck. Not all today, I'm just going to go all the way up through uh, getting the shape of the neck. Just to demonstrate what I would have done, <laughs> what I would have done for the bass guitar neck. So we're not changing topic in this channel, but uh, I'm going to continue to work on, on uh, fixing up this Telecaster in the background. Let me go ahead and show you this Telecaster body that I have. So this here is a Lake Placid Blue Made in Mexico Telecaster that I bought. It was the first guitar I bought. It was the second electric guitar I had. I was about 15. Um, and I think there's a stamp on here that says uh, uh, some date in 1994. So that's an idea of when it was made. Um, I bought this when I was about uh, 15 or a sophomore in high school, somewhere around then. And I played it a lot through high school and college and carry it around with me uh, all throughout uh, until now, obviously. Um, but this is just a body right now because this is the guitar that I disassembled to teach myself how to wire a Telecaster guitar. Um, the neck wasn't all that great, so I ended up selling that and it never got put back together. So here's a perfect opportunity to go ahead and, and build a neck and we'll go ahead and, and uh, finish out this guitar. I'll probably put some money into uh, decent hardware and uh, and lace sensor uh, pickups because that uh, tends to be the, the brand that I'm leaning towards more and more. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. I will set that up in a different playlist and kind of work on it in parallel with this bass guitar. Bass guitar is still taking priority, but uh, now I've got a new guitar project. I didn't need a new guitar project right now, but uh, so there's that. So at this time I want to show off some of my templates. Uh, of course I've got neck templates. This one is for a Telecaster. Well, I've got two that are two different styles of strats. This is uh, like the one that Jimi Hendrix would have played on. And this would be the one that uh, Eric Clapton might have played on. So you've got a, a fat fender head from the, the 60s and you've got a more modern look. Here's a routing template for a pick guard for a strat. Um, here is a, another strat routing template that goes for just the control cavities. So you're going to route the bridge access and the uh, and the control jack and the and the uh, cavity for the electronics and the and the bridge pickup. And you get the middle pickup and the and the uh, neck pickup.
This would go right on top of your piece and you're going to uh, dig out all the all the holes in the guitar. Okay, here is for a Telecaster hollow body. You've got to, uh, if you wanted to cut out the the inside and make make a um, a channeled, chambered, a chambered guitar body. And here we have a strat with a removable part. You get the piece for the bridge that's going to go in the top. And then you're going to remove this piece. Come on, it's a good tight fit. <laughs> anyway, you're going to take this piece out. You take this piece out to route the back where the uh, where the string where the bridge block goes because there's springs that go from the from the inside of the body to the bridge and keep it uh, pulled tight against the string counter pressure. Okay, so this is a master template for a Telecaster. Uh, I actually purchased this one, and this is the template that I would use to make templates from uh, because. In certain cases, you could be riding along with your router and you might um, jump a bit and your router could just dig into the side of your template. You don't want that to happen, so you want to get a, a, uh, another template made against this template to preserve this perfect one. And a master for the uh, Strat. And here's my working template for a Telecaster. Uh, I took notes on it. We've got five thirty second screws, five sixteenths holes on the back, seven eighths deep, seven eighths inch deep, um, inch and a half deep on the uh, control cavity for a Telecaster, and five eighths deep for the for the neck pickup. Now you got your screw holes for the bridge. It's everything I need in one tool. As far as fender necks are concerned, uh, that applies to both Telecaster and Stratocaster. You need uh, you need to have a neck that's right at an inch thickness. Some are one and sixteenth or one and thirty second. Uh, some are uh, are almost seven eighths. Uh, but uh, you need a neck that's right at an inch after it's complete. Now this one, before we even start milling it, is exactly one inch. We have to smooth the faces. There may be some slight cupping that that might come out in uh, as we uh, as we sand it down. I don't know, but uh, we're, we'll probably end up with just under an inch. That's not a problem. I don't know. I haven't decided yet if we're going to have a fretboard because that all that inch also counts with a fretboard. Uh, and if it's uh, and if I do a one piece, that means without a fretboard, then uh, it's uh, it's no problem to add material to the heel. And he and and that one inch really matters just at the heel, where it uh, where it joins with the pocket of the body. Uh, so we could always add a thin she uh, a thin slice of maple from the same board onto the bottom to get that one inch, and it, nobody would ever know. And it wouldn't matter tonally or quality wise. Now at this point, what I want to do is is kind of pick out where I want my neck to come out of. Uh, I could be really conservative and and get it off the edge so I can get as many necks out of this one piece as I can. Or I can look at the grain and really select what I want to show uh, as part of the the art and beauty of the guitar neck. So I've got uh, I've got this whole length to work with and the whole width to where to figure out where I want this particular neck to come out of. And as I look here, I'm really I'm really liking the idea of having a lot of figure showing up through the neck, um, and primarily that would be the back of the neck. If I have a fretboard on it, you would never see it from the front. But um, so here I've got this would be the front, this would be the back. So if I lay it down, what I see here is going to be the front. But you can bet that this grain is going to transfer just as wild to the other side. And I can also choose to take take uh, you know a look at the other side and uh, make my decision based off of either face, either or both faces.
All right, at this point, it doesn't have to be perfect. So this is what we're left with, a rough cut of, of the shape. Um, so what we, what we got here is, is uh, some grain that's going pretty crazy across the top. You can see right here where we have uh, uh, a high point after it, was, after it was cut level at the sawmill. We're left with uh, some contour that uh, looks, like, looks like the knot was coming straight out of here. Uh, and then at the headstock, we've got some nice long sweeping grain on both sides. Got some, some ugliness that we'll have to sand away. Um, this will be the heel of the guitar. We may or may not have to build that up depending on, on some of the decisions we make. But this is what the back of the neck is going to look like. Um, this, is, this grain is going to be um, pretty interesting, especially once we get the, the back uh, of the curved neck um, all complete. And then on the end grain, we've got nice, long, horizontal, tight grain right here. This should be a very stable neck. And if not, I'll throw it away and make another one. That's the advantage of having some skill with uh, guitar making. All right, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and attach the neck template to the neck blank. Uh, then we'll take it. Uh, this, is, this is actually pretty close. I don't think I'm going to take it back over to the to the bandsaw, I think we'll take it right over here to the, the rigid oscillating spindle sander and, and we'll finesse the edges as close as we can to the neck template before we take it to the router. And I've got a couple ways I can go about attaching the template to the, the stock. Uh, one is to put an actual screw through the template into the stock. And right now I've got the screw uh, holes uh, aligned so that they would go into where the skunk stripe would be. Now a skunk stripe is is something that uh, you might have seen on uh, typically fender, fender guitars but it's a it's a on the back of the neck it's a strip of wood usually a darker wood than a maple uh, just to give it a, a cool contrast let the airplane go by but the skunk stripe is is essentially a uh, patch that's going to cover your your uh, truss rod channel uh, if you were using um, uh, a one-piece neck, that means no fretboard, you would you would route a channel up the back of your neck to install and insert the uh, the truss rod, and then you would cover it up with a piece of uh, walnut, perhaps, or or rosewood, but you'd have a, a contrasting wood to be a skunk stripe, and that would be where the screw would go into before the router channel the the truss rod channel gets routed in. Okay, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I've not decided if there's going to be a one piece or a two piece yet. Um, but we're going to go ahead and use double stick tape. Uh, usually the kind of tape you'd use, you'd find in a carpet layers toolbox. Um, but uh, this particular template has paper uh, with the center line and stuff uh, attached to it. So I'm not going to tape this side. Instead I'm going to tape it on from the back and we will and we will uh, do our router work from the, the back side to the front side. This is one of the greatest tools that uh, Home Depot ever used to sell. I haven't seen them sold there for years but uh, came in right at around I want to say $200 it might have been more but uh, this thing has it almost it get, it get used on almost every one of my projects. Um, since I'm in the army, I move around a lot, and uh, this thing actually got bent, so it's a little out of alignment. Uh, so it could be better, but I can't find um, a replacement. So it's either got the belt sander part. Let me turn it on and show you how it works, because it also goes up and down. You see that wobble? It's because whoever whoever uh, was moving us didn't care, and you know this got stuff sat on top of it. But uh, um, uh, in the end, it got bent. So I'm just trying to remember how to take this off. It's been a while. I usually just keep this on there, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, put one of these drums on there. They, 
couple different sizes. I'll go with this one. Yeah, I'll go with this one. It actually wants me to turn the screw the opposite way that uh, the standard. Here we go. Okay. And there's actually a place to mount this for storage back here. And this comes up. To cover. This goes back here in place of that. Okay. And I'd bring this up. Slides right on there. And you got a ring that goes here. Turn in the standard way. This is the non standard. So instead of righty tidy, it's righty loosey and lefty tidy. You need a washer. This one right here. As I compress that down, it makes that rubber uh, rubber trunk expand and tighten up against the 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 round sandpaper. A yeah, little bit of wobble. All right, let's get to it. Ideally, I don't have anything here to block my way, so I can move this. I love that all my tools are on carts. So I'm keeping my eye on the gap back here that I don't that I don't wander into my template. Because if I put a notch in my template, then the router bearing is going to follow that notch, and that's what's going to end up being on the uh, on the stock that I'm working with. Okay, now here we are at my router table where I've got the the bottom mounted uh, bearing flush cut trim router bit mounted uh, or installed into the router. The router is mounted underneath the, the table and screwed in from the bottom. So this is what we have uh, from, from the bottom and, uh, and the template is ready to go. And uh, I'll bring you down here closer and show you exactly what I'm going to do before I actually do it. So the router is going to be on. Um, there's actually little arrows here that show the direction of the cutter. Uh, which is going to be counterclockwise, and we're going to be going against counterclockwise. In other words, from right to left. Um, the bearing here is set up so that it will uh, go right against the template. I'm going to see if I can raise the entire motor from below to get more, uh, more cut, more of the cutting surface against the actual surface that we need. Uh, right now, I'm just screwing. Okay, that's maxed out right there. Um, and it happens to be right at the very top of the stock. Which may or may not be enough, but that's okay. Um, so the bearing is, is riding along the template here. And we'll be cutting out. Yeah, there's going to be a little lip left over uh, on the stock. But uh, I'm going to show you exactly how we're going to fix that once we get the first pass out of the way all right um shoot i think we're ready to do this let me go ahead and plug the machine in
All right, so there's definitely a lesson to be learned when cutting across end grain and curves. It's going to bite into it. So if there's any place you're going to want to sand as close as possible to the line, it's on the end grains, uh, especially at the tip here. This end wasn't too bad at all, but uh, something about uh, the end here and the curve and the inside curve here, uh, the bit really wants to grab it and, and rip it out of your hands. Um, in that case, it's, it's best to let, uh, just to let the, let the tool take it from you. Using a template with a router and a flush cut, flush trim, cut, flush cut trim. Using a template with a router is one of the key skills in luthery. 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 Luthery.